what we what we have in mind here is um, first each one of these individuals is going to tell you a little bit about their company uh, sort of three or five minute uh, uh, a little uh, uh, summary I don't think of it as an elevator speech because they've already gone past that stage all right so they're not trying to sell you anything what they're trying to do is describe what they do because these are very different companies and then we've got a series of four questions that I'm going to pose to the panel and uh, at the end of that time, which um, I hope will be uh, half an hour, maybe a little longer, uh, we will turn it open for questions. So that's uh, what we have in mind. So um, uh, let me start with uh, Alyssa. Alyssa, why don't you introduce yourself and your company? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Alyssa Rapp. I am the founder and CEO of Bottlenotes.com. I was in your shoes from 2003 to 2005 with Pete Flint over here. Uh, Bottle Notes began as a niche e-commerce company. We started as a wine club concept, really, where the innovation in the online wine space we were hoping to achieve and have achieved is building out a personalized sommelier service. So we deliver wine tailored to our members' personal tastes using proprietary matching technology. Think Netflix or Pandora of wine. Uh, as the company evolved in the first year, we fan our e-commerce platform fan to include not only wine clubs, but corporate gifting and events, because some of our early adopters said, we like this notion of a personalized sommelier, but we'd like it even more if we could apply it beyond just ourselves. And then in the end of the second year of existence in 07, uh, some of our early adopters came back to us and said, well, we love our wish list con the wish list functionality you have, but what we'd really like is to use that as a registry, like we're getting married and we want to start our marriage with a new wine cellar. So a light bulb went off in our minds, and we created the first national wine registry, and that we've integrated with WeddingChannel.com. And so far, it's still one of the only – it's the only one of its nature. I'm, we are sure we're going to be emulated pretty quickly here. But that means that the e-commerce – BottleNotes.com, the e-commerce business is this notion of wine clubs, online wine shop, corporate gifts and events, and the first national wine registry – and we have dovetailed in the last three years to not only include our own direct-to-consumer distribution channels, uh, but also an indirect distribution channel. So we have five partners and a few more in, in the wings for their own e-commerce wine platforms powered by bottlenotes. And uh, that white labeling, as we call it, is uh, a great path for growth. Uh, it's also equally difficult of a business as the direct-to-consumer business, so it has pluses and minuses to it. And then in addition to the core direct-to-consumer business and the indirect-to-consumer business through partners, uh, indirect-to-consumer channel, in the last six months in particular, we relaunched our website. And we did that with a little bit of a mind eye to what the economy is doing and also what our, our consumers wanted. And so bottlenotes.com, as of November 2008, is no longer a niche e-commerce platform. It's actually a destination where commerce meets community. We have the most trafficked wine Facebook app. We're building out a mobile platform, et cetera, et cetera. And bottlenotes.com is not just a place you go to buy wine, but you go to get wine information, both personalized recommendations, as we still have that patent-pending matching technology, but even more community recommendations, peer recommendations, celebrity recommendations, and so forth. And the reason we shifted strategically was because, A, we, we found, I founded the company to be a – and really do – a, match, a matching service, if you will, in the wine industry to be a wine marketing firm for wineries and importers and a wine entertainment and education platform for consumers. And the monetization strategy was, well, we can do that and we'll make money as we move bottles of wine. But what we've found is that the body of content we've created ourselves, I wrote a book this last October called Bottle Notes Guide to Wine, Around the World in 80 Sips, blah, blah, blah. We have a wine encyclopedia. We have newsletters and podcast libraries and such. All that content that we are really using as a customer retention tool to drive e-commerce really has a life of its own, and the community has taken on a life of its own, which has been terrific. So what we realize is that that community, being the premier online wine community, that will, of course, continue to partially monetize its user base through direct sales is something we very much still want to do, but the, the new strategy and the new platform allows us to also monetize through advertising revenue. And on Monday, we'll be launching something called the Daily Sip, which any of you all who know Daily Candy or Thrillist or Urban Daddy, anyone heard of those sites? Yeah. So we're launching the Daily Sip, which we hope will be the Daily Candy of Wine to even further push us in that notion, in that direction of the premier online wine community. So that's the, that's the three-minute overview of the business. 
Thank you. Could you say just a little more about how you how you specialize the the wine list? I'm assuming you don't start with DNA. You, uh, uh, unfortunately, unlike Pandora, we haven't undertaken the wine genome project yet. But I'd love to if I had all the all the funding in the world. God knows we'd do that. It'd be fun. Um, we actually the the patent is around categorizing the world of wine into different style profiles. So the innovation is that we categorize the world each wine into different style profiles based on its varietal composition, its regional um, origin, and so forth. But the cool part comes in that human beings who come on our site, whether they're wine club members or now just community members, complete a personal taste profile. Not too different from, in some ways, at a high level about what you might hear about Trulia. And so you, you com in terms of personalization of search. Um, but you complete a personal taste profile that com asks questions such as, how do you take your coffee and tea? How much do you salt your foods? And those questions intimate your sensitivity to bitterness. And your sensitivity to bitterness gives us a snapshot of your likes and dislikes in wine. And the more wine you rate, the more we hone our understanding of your preferences. So the matching technology is literally a, a math engine where you've got people's profiles and wine profiles, and you're making mathematical matches. Interesting. So it's, it's partly choice, but it's also partly individual characteristics. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Pete, tell us a little bit about your company. Uh, OK, so Pete Flint. Uh, co-founder, CEO of Trulia. We are a website designed to empower people to make better decisions about real estate, which obviously is kind of pretty interesting right now. Um, we, we launched in the summer of 2005, and ever since then, the real estate market has gone down and down and down and down. Um, luckily, we've grown um, since then. So as a company, we are around 80 people right now. Um, I graduated, as I said, in um, class of 2005. Um, 80 people, we're one of the largest real estate websites in the US with around 5 million unique monthly users. Um, raised $33 million in venture capital from Sequoia and Axel uh, and Angels and, and other folks. Uh, how we make money, so we make money selling ads to uh, the people within the real estate industry, that's um, kind of on a display basis. So it's kind of taking the money that used to be spent in the newspapers uh, and moving to that to where the audience is, which is online. So that's, it's, um, it's a big business. It's a huge business, but it's also a tough business because when, when your advertisers are also struggling, um, it's difficult to, to make money off them. But the proposition is, is very compelling. So, so our product... Um, I encourage everyone to go to a website and spend lots of time and click on all the ads. Um, <laughs> but if you don't do that, what we do is um, uh, we have a search engine for homes for sale, uh, property database, pretty much all the properties in, in the US. We have um, all the data around real estate, so that's price trends, um, community data profile, demographic profile, recent home sales. We have uh, a community, which is... Uh, the largest real estate community on the web, which is primarily around Q&A and also blogging and articles. So if people have a question about what does Obama's housing stimulus plan mean to me as a first-time buyer, um, they go in and ask those sort of questions, uh, and that's booming right now. And who answers them? Do you guys answer them, or does the community answer them? So the community answers them. So, uh, and can you say how you, how you get your listings? Yeah, so we've... Um, uh, we've partnered uh, pretty much with the real estate industry. So, so we have about 95 of the top 100 real estate companies in the U.S. Um, feed their listings into us. So they give us data feeds or they come in and enter them uh, on the site. So, uh, you know, everyone from Caldwell Banker to local sites like Allen Pinnell. So we've gone around and built those data relationships with thousands of companies. What about individuals who don't list with a real estate company? Uh, we don't really offer that much service for them. It's primarily around, um, they can use our services, but it's primarily around the, the real estate agents and brokers. Okay, good. Darren. I'm Darren Buxbaum. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hourglass Technologies. Uh, Hourglass is a medical device company, and uh, we're developing a safer incisionless alternative to obesity surgery. So uh, when I was first uh, looking at this, uh, I was actually working at Medtronic at the time, which is a big medical device company. And uh, 
I have I have family members who were um, morbidly obese, and that's just to give you a sense. It's usually defined as being a hundred pounds overweight, and uh, really saw my family members struggling and wanted. To, and they were thinking about getting uh, obesity surgery. Those were things like gastric bypass or the lap band, T typically very invasive surgeries, and they're frankly it's, they're pretty frightening. So. Uh, they didn't end up getting it because uh, they were scared of it, and the family was scared for them. Uh, at the same time, I saw Medtronic was uh, open up a brand new obesity division uh, to look at less invasive uh, therapies. And to give you a sense of it, uh, you know, Medtronic's divisions, each one usually does a couple billion dollars in revenue. So when I came, uh, set foot on Stanford uh, as an MBA, I immediately wanted to look into the space and uh, went through the Stanford Bio Design program, uh, used some classes at the business school, and then when I graduated in 2007, uh, launched this company uh, with uh, someone from the med school and a, a few people from the engineering school. Uh, we raised our first round of capital. Jeremy Ford, let's, let's hold that for a little later about how yeah. you did it. Yep. But just let's say a little more about what you do now. So, so you were an obesity, um, uh, yep. Company, you address that as a disease. Uh, where are you in the st in the stage of delivering a product, and how are you developing that? Yeah, so everyone else will probably talk about revenues. Revenues for us are in the in the distant future uh, because we first have to get through uh, FDA approvals. So to kind of give you a, a, a quick concept of how an obesity company kind of evolves. Um, first, you have to go through preclinical trials uh, before you can then run your run human trials, and and that's where we are right now. We're just gearing up for our, our first human trials later this year. Um, you have to prove that your device is safe, uh, and then and run a small trial, you know, 30 patients in that in that regard, and then you'll implant your device in a, a larger group of patients. Uh, typically, obesity companies use about 300 patients. Uh, and uh, then you wait uh, for about a year, and uh, you hope that your device helps people lose a, lose you know at least 25 percent of their their excess weight. Um, the results, though, and I've met with some of the patients who have gone through um, these types of obesity surgeries. Uh, they're incredible. Um, I, I mean, it's you know people literally say it's like getting their lives back uh, in that. And that's what we're hoping to do for patients in a much safer way. They let, allow them to, you know, drop literally 50 plus, uh, 50 to 100 pounds. I've met patients who have dropped 250 pounds uh, and, you know, ran beta breakers the next year. Uh, and so our company is looking to do the, the same thing. But, uh, you know, the way surgery works today is they have to make different incisions into the person's abdomen, um, implant a device, or they have to kind of staple, um, staple the stomach. And the concept is if uh, you make a patient's uh, stomach smaller, they'll feel fuller faster and they'll eat less. Um, we're going to do the same thing, but we can deliver our therapies transorally, um, so without any incisions, without general anesthesia. It'll be a lot faster for physicians to do, and it'll be a lot... Um, a lot less expensive for patients because, amazingly, um, almost a third of patients actually pay for this procedure out of their own pocket um, because they, they are just, you know, insurance sometimes is, it's, the healthcare system in the, in, the, in the U.S. is very difficult and they truly want to uh, get these procedures and feel better so they'll, they're willing to pay out of their own pockets. So we're looking, you know, 20, 2012 plus time frame uh, until patients uh, can eventually have our products. Uh, so you said you work for Medtronics, but do you have a medical background? Uh, yes. So I was a biomedical engineer from Duke uh, and then went to work at Medtronic, and actually in marketing and uh, project management. Good. Thank you. Brad. Uh, yeah, my name is Brad Straw. I was class of uh, 2002, so um, I don't have a biomedical degree, so I run a debt relief company. Um, we started our business, I co-founded it with Andrew Hauser, who was a classmate uh, of mine and a good friend. We actually started it about a year after we graduated from business school, which uh, we'll go into in a little bit. 
But in some ways, my experience was kind of analogous maybe to some of you guys, is when I accepted to come to, uh, to Stanford Business School, NASDAQ was at 5,000 and Pets.com was a big thing and Sand Hill was like Mecca. Um, in shortly after uh, agreeing to come to Stanford, NASDAQ created and the dot-com thing sort of fell apart and you were just happy to have a job. So in 2002, when I came out, I think we were the only two people uh, that started a company our year. And if you sort of went back to when we joined uh, or came to school in 2000, there was something like 50 companies were started. So uh, a room full of people is encouraging here. But we, Freedom Financial Network is a 525-person company that does a whole bunch of direct-to-consumer financial services, including freedom debt relief, freedom tax relief, uh, a little bit in the mortgage space. Um, and really what we kind of innovated on, and we'll get into this of how we kind of launched the business, is we thought the consumer finance world was broken for people who fall out of the current payer kind of super prime world with a bunch of relatively poor executed on point products, and we wanted to be a suite of services and kind of align our interests with, uh, with the consumers. Um, and it's been a, a fun and uh, exciting ride that um, we've been relatively successful, and uh, Chuck knows our story well. He's on our board, and Ben Sloop from the st campus of uh, the GSB runs Consolidation Plus product for us, too, which is um, kind of the next product we're launching. Thank you. So you have a, an idea of what these companies do now and a little bit about the individuals. Uh, we, we wanted it to um, address four questions, as I indicated. And we're going to start this, uh, this the first question with Brad. And so, Brad, say a little bit about what you did while you were in school to prepare for this, um, either in terms of searching for the idea or ideas, um, trying to evaluate ideas. Did you do that while you were here, or did you wait till you let you you were ready to leave? Tell us a little bit about that process. Yes. Yeah, so um, we started a year after we graduated. So. Really, the lion's share of the work we did was after we graduated from school. But while we were in school, um, one sort of critical thing for me that, you know, I don't know if this resonates with you guys, but I had a tough time getting focused and sort of discipline on uh, working on business ideas my second year of business school, and I think Andrew did too. Having a co-founder and a sounding board and an advisor of someone that sort of holds you accountable to your ideas and your homework project and your research on industries and business plans was really critical for us is we would meet weekly and go through and give each other homework projects. You've got to do a little PowerPoint slide on this industry, how big it is. And I think if it were just me uh, in a vacuum, I probably wouldn't have been as accountable to that. But I ended up, Andrew turned all of his jobs down. We were private equity venture capital guys and was really committed to the, the startup model. And we went through a hundred business ideas before we ended up all over the place, from jewelry rental, a bunch of dot-com businesses, um, buying a suite of cabs in Chicago to uh, I went to a private equity firm that did a lot in consumer finance and I had done a bunch in consumer finance and investing in collections and mortgage and we really got just infatuated with this idea that enormous industry fragmented weak competition and a ton of margin in the kind of economic rents in the value chain and we didn't know how to crack that nut but we just got really committed to that was going to be our industry Fortunately, being in a private equity firm for eight months, I realized this is not what I want to do, number one. And number two, uh, I got to see a lot of business plans, and a lot of them with high margins, it, it directly applicable to those uh, verticals that we were looking at, or that kind of larger uh, space. We really got quickly onto this idea of getting people out of debt. And the fact that, you know, negative connotations, and it's got a lot of weak competition, but you can't pick a bigger, I mean, 13 trillion in consumer debt, two and a half trillion revolving. Uh, 90 billion charges off is uncollectible every year, and essentially no Stanford MBAs go after that space. So our eyes got big of this is a lot easier than competing with, you know, HBS and uh, GSB guys for the next venture deal is let's go compete with a bunch of guys who used to sell used cars and we'll do you know, a lot better job and innovate. And our innovation was to sort of have ROI-based pricing for the consumer and do real education and budgeting and a suite of services um, quit my job, raised some angel, angel financing from uh, some GSB friends and family, from the partners at the, uh, at the venture firm I worked at, and um, launched with Andrew. Would you, would you have found this idea if you hadn't worked in private equity, do you think? Because you and Andrew were continuing to think about ideas, yeah. right? Yeah. I wouldn't have found it if I hadn't partnered with Andrew, and he wouldn't have found it if he hadn't partnered with me. Um, 
We may have found it because one of our classmates, a guy named Kent Steffes, who you know well too, he had Bloomberg terminals in his GSB dorm room, which cost $30,000 a year. He's a, he, a guy who won a gold medal in the Atlantic uh, Olympics for you know beach two-on-two beach volleyball. It was Steffes Karai. He's a really aggressive guy, and he negotiated <laughs> himself out of $30,000 of debt to Bloomberg, and we watched this exercise over about six months and thought, there's no way an average person could ever go through this agony, and this guy loves it. That, <laughs> that kind of married with the fact, and he lived with Andrew and Jeff and, uh, uh, and was one of my really good friends, um, that combined with going out and seeing the margins in these collection agencies um, and the margins in the mortgage industry, and then us, we just started putting ads in newspapers and saying we're going to do free consultations with people and figure out what are your pain points, what are your needs, and the whole thing kind of coalesced that maybe we would have, but it certainly accelerated it, the fact that I was in front of a lot of different business plans, ideas, economic models in a short amount of time. So, Darren, um, um, what did you do while you were here? Uh, it sounds to me like you found some, some uh, people across the street, as we say, mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, work with. How did you do that? Uh, so one of one of my deciding factors to come to Stanford over maybe some other business school on the East Coast uh, was the biodesign program, and uh, it's an incredible interdisciplinary interdisciplinary program that brings folks together from the business school, the med school, uh, and the engineering schools um, to just tackle the biggest problems in in health, and, and typically utilizing medical devices. Um, like, like I said, I kind of had this burning desire to work in the obesity space. So the, the most important thing I, I, I think I decided to do um, at Stanford was to pick the right group of people to work with. Um, so to kind of give an example of that, at the beginning of the course, uh, you did a poster on like what your medical need was, what it was addressing, and you tried to attract people to your group. Um, a lot of people came by and they kind of saw it, like the space I was working on, but a couple of, uh, a few people came by multiple times and said, this is really what I want to do, this is really what I want to work on, um, and we're really excited about it. And I just decided to work with those people because they genuinely seemed really excited. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it couldn't have worked out better, and I think that made all the difference in the world. Um, was getting people who were really enthusiastic, willing to stay, you know, do the projects till whatever time um, it, it took. Um, actually, missed a Valentine's Day because of it, uh, and you know that I think the people were the the key ingredient and the the support at Stanford, both at the by design. Uh, I picked another great group of um, classmates to work with in the evaluating entrepreneurial opportunities class at the business school. Um, those were really great ways of kind of exploring ideas and then evaluating the ideas. And then once I went through that, I felt comfortable kind of burning the bridge and right at graduation um, trying to go raise capital. Great, thanks. Pete? Um, <clears throat> so the business, the business idea came uh, between the summers of the first and the second year, um, actually partly because I was trying to find someone to live for my housemates for the second year and started looking around on Craigslist and everything else and started intrigued by the real estate industry and it, it really sucked. Um, and so it, at, the, at, the end of the second, at the end of the summer, I was pretty convinced that this was a business that um, was very interesting and I had an entrepreneurial background before. I consume internet, so I um, felt comfortable with the challenge ahead. And at that point, it was really a case of, okay, I knew I wanted to start a business. Um, my co-founder, who's a good friend and classmate, um, uh, we teamed up very, very early on and said this was the business that we both wanted to run. Um, and at that point, it was really this whole of the second year was class was important. We absolutely wanted to graduate. Um, but we spent every single opportunity to get credit for... Um, uh, thinking about this business, we could. So we did the S356. Um, Andy Ratcliffe spending half an hour or an hour a week with Andy every single week for two quarters is just phenomenal. Um, tapping the insights and ideas of all the professors we could. Um, and as you probably guessed, I was born in England, so I knew no one else. So, so I knew no one in, in the US, really, apart from people at the GSB. So the GSB 
was, was really my only um, resource for, for information other than um, you know, cold calling people or, um, or getting in touch with people. Um, so just using all the credits I could. Um, and is that, that was the question? No, good. Yeah, good. Good. Listen, what about you? So I had sort of the opposite experience of Brad. I got to the GSB knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but in the first six months I got pretty involved in the wine club. Wine was a hobby and a passion. And, uh, and I was pretty struck by two things. One, how relatively thirsty, for lack of a better pun, the, uh, the wineries and importers that we were bringing in at that time for, to do the wine club. I don't know what level of intensity the wine club has here right now. At that point, we were, Kevin Kumler and I were pretty intense about it. We had a few events a week, and we really were both considering entering the wine industry and, and had a, quite a wonderful array of people come in. We were really struck. I was really struck by how thirsty these wineries and importers were to market their products to these consumers and I was also struck by how relatively ex well traveled extremely well educated uh, our peers are at the GSB how people were pretty intimidated by wine so I didn't portend to have all the answers but I certainly felt empowered to find out information and, and get people to help guide us into and through the world of wine and so the idea that notion of providing some sort of guiding function for consumers into the world of wine was something that started to gel for me really early in my first year. And like all of these people, I, I was pretty shameless about using my time here to, to help in that regard. I wrote a case for Jin Wang it's, um, that he teaches still on New Vine Logistics, our back-end logistics management firm that we use to distribute wine throughout um, 25 out of the 50 states. I wrote that case while here. They're now our partner for that. Did a market research project with Michaela Draganska, who's on sabbatical this year, but on our advisory board. Jim Latin's doing a, you know, did a project with him in his marketing class, digging into some of the um, matching, actually a 390 with him on, on the matching piece and personal taste profiles. And he's doing a sales, a little module on bottle notes right now. I actually see some familiar faces in the audience looking into some ideas on how we can increase sales through our registry. Um, so I've We've been undercapitalized from day one, something I strongly would discourage. Uh, but it's also been only because of the extraordinary resources during the GSB that we were able to put all the pieces together. And since that, you know, through summer ESP summer interns and, and great advisory board members and the like, that it's been, uh, and classmates on the advisory board as well, that we've been able to get as far as we have on, on such relative economic fumes. Um, in terms of in terms of actually the business plan, it was an evolutionary process during my time here. I too, actually like Brad, had a classmate that I worked on it with. She knew from pretty early on she wanted to go into venture, so she was more of a thought partner and, and me, had in those weekly meetings where you grab a room in the library and you whiteboard where you're going next, but she was great and has founder shares and all that, a good friend. Um, but when it came time to actually take the plunge, uh, I ended up, relatively speaking, taking it alone. Um, I ended up pulling in a close friend who's 10 years my senior but had her own business for 10 years in New York, also a Yale grad, um, who had been in the wine world. And I ended up pulling her in as a director of biz dev, co-founder slash director of biz dev. So I, I do concur that it is much, much, much nicer to take the plunge, jump off the proverbial cliff with a partner. Um, our partnership is not one of equals, incidentally, in time, equity, cash, invested, all of that. But, um, but it absolutely is something that I have nonetheless really benefited from. So all – and those relationships solidified. That relationship was one that was actually formed through a mutual friend at the GSB. So you, you've all said a little bit about what you did at the GSB, and you've said a little bit about um, the classmates. But um, let me start with you, Pete, because uh, you said that basically being from England, what you had here was the GSB, and that was about it. Um, but as you as you started the company and you moved out, what other resources in the community did you find helpful? Uh, how did you um, uh, put together your business plan? Uh, did you how did you find your your legal firm? How did you begin to attract those resources? Uh, so primarily networking, and you know it's really using the resources. So just perhaps a couple of examples. So at first, um, so we went to get a prototype done. We went over to. Um, there's, I don't know if it still runs, but there's a there's a group of students, student student enterprises or something that that do some basic they do some basic coding. So so anyway, the we paid some student en uh, some engineering students to build some prototypes. We end up hiring the guy that did the prototypes for us. He's graduating. We 
um, our legal counsel, there was David Hornick, who was a um, teaching <clears throat> intellectual property class. He was an ex-lawyer who was a professor. Um, he introduced us to three or four legal firms. We, we picked one of them. Um, I spent the summer at the end of my second year at the CES, kind of camped out there with Linda and the gang, um, using all the resources because we didn't have an office uh, and, until we had that. So using pretty much all the resources we had. One of the, one of the other things that we did was um, in the early stages, we were doing market research. We, it's much easier to pick up the phone and say you're a Stanford Business School student than it is you are joeblow.com um, real estate site because they don't know whether you're a competitor, they don't know who you are, and, they, and a lot of people think of spending time with students <coughs> as kind of intellectual philanthropy. And so, so you can spend time with people and you can pick their brains. And it was, it was amazing how much time we got um, and how open people were. Um, sometimes competitors, potential competitors were maybe too open, but we were always very honest about kind of our intentions and you know, that we were thinking of starting a business. Um, but we were students and we were doing some market research. We got so much, so much um, achieved by, by putting ourselves as Stanford students. Well, so you're shaking your head. So you did the same, totally. same thing? I mean, totally did the same thing, still do the same thing, have, you know, really great student projects happening and have for a long time and totally honest and, but, you know, had a summer intern this last summer looking into our international strategy because a, a firm in Dubai was really interested in participating. And I said, I know nothing about that, the wine world in that market and have at it. So I think the, the notion of being a student of any topic or industry is something as literal students or as... Um, interns is a, a really great resource to leverage out of the GSB, but you know, I, the GSB is just, I mean, why we all chose and why we're all probably in this room right now is just one of the richest entrepreneurial places in the country, if not the world, and you know, from lawyer found sitting in Bishop when Allison Tilly of Pillsbury came walking through and she was willing to do all the setup work for the corporation without us um, paying for it until the time of the first financing, or you know, in the list, in and the first service provider lended itself to other service providers, accountants, and all the rest. I mean, the list that that's one example. The list goes on and on and on, and and not just Stanford, um, not just you know being a student and getting people come through here, but even since we have an entrepreneurial list serve for our class, and I mean the amount of forwarding and recommending of next hires or or service providers, or you name it, that comes through that. It's, it's sort of, once someone gives it a high, once a classmate or, or a fellow alumni gives it a, a, a stamp of approval, bookkeep, my bookkeeper has been farmed out, I think, to four other GSB businesses. So, I mean, it, you know, it just, it's a really rich network, and it's fortunate. And, and just one on the, I, um, so Brad was sitting up here three or four years ago, and I came and grabbed Brad afterwards and said, hey, Brad, I've got this idea about real estate. Can we have a coffee? He gave up his time. I actually haven't, I haven't seen you since, but it's kind of funny how... Um, I, I didn't get founder's shares. <laughs> 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 well, one of, the things, one of the things you're hearing here is uh, how generous the alumni are. Uh, they, it's an incredible group, and part of it is the reason they're all here today helping you, and you just heard that they'd be happy if you grab them afterwards. <laughs> so, uh, so, so Darren, just not, not the financing resources yet, but just um, other resources at Stanford, not your, not your classmates, and as you started moving out on this. Well, I, I mean, obviously the professors are, are pretty good here. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the, uh, I mean, what's incredible is that to realize that a lot of the professors here are just so well connected with the uh, with the Sand Hill Road crew, um, with industry thought leaders um, around the world, and uh, and a lot of them are practitioners who have just had the experiences of have been there, done that. Um, so I still go to um, to one of my professors on almost a quarterly basis, um, looking for advice, uh, sometimes looking for some financial resources, uh, but uh, I mean it. I, I don't think there's a VC that uh, that this individual doesn't know, um, and they're so incredibly giving of their time. I mean, the fact that they're here teaching is I mean, obviously they want to give back to uh, back to the students. So I, I think just as giving as the alumni are, 
Um, I mean, the professors are, are equally so. Brad, what about you? Yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I'd echo all of that. A cold intro saying you're a Stanford Business School student to someone who's never met you before is a very powerful thing, shockingly. I mean, a lot of people will return your calls. The alumni network, even cold, is a very powerful thing. To this day, I get calls. It's I went to a small college, too, Amherst College, where I'm very happy to return those calls, and I get solicited dozens of times a day. It's a Stanford thing people are pretty loyal to. The other is warm intros. We've gotten introduced to uh, Chuck's on our board. You know, a bunch of professors here have been uh, really invaluable to us. CEO of, you know, Wells Fargo, Capital One, uh, senators. And they don't do it because they're doing I mean, I think it's, uh, there's a positive selection bias to professors here that they want to see you succeed, and they want to go out of the way to help you. Um, that is, uh, for us, has been very powerful. Tactically, we have a GSB guy from 93 or 94, Ariel Polar's on our board, who's a serial entrepreneur and very successful almost everything he touches. That's a very powerful thing to have on your board because then you don't have to waste time vetting accounting firms and tax firms and uh, just tactical things. A guy who's seen five companies succeed, he just says, here's the one to pick. Here's the partner to go with. Here's the intro to this firm. And you trust that resource. And it's, um, I'd say from a board level, really, really valuable. One last thing tactically that... Um, Kind of Pete was talking about chatting with competitors, but I don't know if you guys have Career Builder or Hot Jobs or Monster through the CES. You can call almost anyone and say you're thinking about, you're interviewing people for whatever role. You make up what that role is when you're in business school and you're launching a company. They will talk endlessly about anything you want to talk about, and you get a lot of very valuable information um, under the pretense of I'm interviewing you. We actually ended up hiring some of those people that in our sort of first year when we were essentially business planning and using those people as to fill out the whiteboard of what the economic model looks like. We ended up hiring some of those people, but we also got a ton of very good intelligence out of interviews. Yeah, it turns out that most people who have done something, <coughs> something that's good know it, they're proud of it, and would love to tell you about it. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's an important thing to, re to realize. Darren, so let's talk about um, a financing. Uh, and you can start us off. So what did you do when you realized you had 12 years to go on this before you saw any revenue? And maybe not that, but yeah, six at least. I, I realized that there's a very big black hole of capital uh, that capital is going to need to fill at the time. So, you know, kind of laid out the plan um, and realized that this, was, this project was going to take 50 to $60 million uh, to get to profitability on. Um, so, but what I didn't like have a have a great appreciation for was spending that first million would actually be the the most important money spent uh, on the project, uh, and you know, I guess it's you you can't really talk about financing without talking about milestones, um, and that was something that, that was totally lost on me upon graduation. Also, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to I have to I you know I have to do preclinical trials and go into human trials. I knew to get a proof of concept would take it took. Some of my competitors, you know, a minimum of three to five million dollars. So I thought, okay, uh, I'll go and raise three to five million dollars. But um, and looking at that number, I realized, well, it's too big for angels. It probably it probably need to be venture capital. Uh, that totally went vacillated back and forth because I, I started meeting some really um, incredible people, uh, other entrepreneurs who had been in a similar situation, and I, I can't. I can't recommend it enough talking to people who have been in your shoes before who have, especially on similar type projects, because he said, no, you don't need $5 million. You need a half a million dollars. And I thought he was crazy. Um, and then I realized that he wasn't. And there was ways to take out, make shorter term milestones, because it's really hard at school to, to get people to shell out millions of dollars when you don't have this long track record. It's much easier when you're saying, well, here's a, I want to do a half a million dollars. Here's exactly how I'm going to spend it. And then build up your track record. And then now that you have this track record that you, you do what you say you're going to do, it makes it so much easier to raise subsequent ca capital. Uh, so, you know, half a million dollars, I thought that was an angel, more of an angel play. So I started talking to angels for a while. And by the way, the, the moral of the story is definitely leave yourself like at least nine months of uh, cash that you know you can live on before you really have to raise capital because it takes a while uh, to do it right out of school. 
Um, so, and I talked to classmates before, and it takes almost everybody about you know February March time frame. That's when they get their capital. Uh, so went to the angels, started talking to angels. It's amazing. There are people here that you talk with them. They they afterwards are like, well, should I send, email you the fifty thousand dollar check, or do you like want to put it in the bank? I mean, the uh, serial entrepreneurs in the valley are mind boggling. Uh, so I actually that, that you guys can all get access to, right? Yeah. I mean, they, 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 I don't think you get a meeting with a lot of those guys dead serious uh, without you know maybe an intro or you say I'm a Stanford Business School guy. I'm starting a company. A lot of people will sit down with you. That's uh, absolutely true. Uh, and was looking at angels, and then all of a sudden, a, a small seed stage VC got very interested, uh, and was able to actually blend the two and have like the VC lead the round, and angels kind of come in later, which which worked out really nicely because the the VC took the responsibility of sitting on the board and it allowed the angels to be a little bit more passive, but feel very comfortable uh, that there was someone very actively monitoring the business. So that that was the C, that was the early stage, and now you know we're we're doing our, our follow on uh, follow on round right now. So Pete, uh, you uh, had been involved in an entrepreneurial activity before, uh, and then you started this company, um, as you said, uh, not exactly uh, the markets haven't been exactly um, kind to you, um, real estate markets. So what, what, what's what been your experience in raising money? First, the first money and then the follow-on money, if there has been? Um, so I guess, like, contrasting to, to Brad, in 2005, uh, in 2006, when we did um, initial fundraising, um, really proof-of-concept fundraising, it was relatively easy compared to 2002. So I think, you know, and compared to today. So I think we, we certainly were, were quite lucky with the timing. Maybe just a couple of um, perspectives from that process. Um, we thought it would be really cool to get a big name VC um, before we'd launched, um, but it's practically impossible. Um, and we spent far too much time with big VCs, um, and it's probably not the right thing to do anyway, to raise a lot of money without having launched. So we wasted too much time with, um, with big name VCs early on, but that said, it's useful to spend time with super smart people who understand the space and can follow you and track you. And a lot of the people that turned us down in the early stages ended up investing in later stages after we'd hit, hit some milestones. Um, secondly, we, um, you know, as a web company um, and as a product company, um, showing someone a fantastic um, business plan or spreadsheet or model or market analysis only is is ten percent of the exercise. Um, we found our conversion rates of raising money was was substantially improved when we improved when we had a really cool website that people could look at and play with and thought, oh, this is awesome! I get it. Um, so you know, however good your um, market analysis is, and however much it passes the the um, the test of the professors, the product. If you've got a product, um, spend more time on getting a cool product, a useful product, a product that resonates, and your conversion to raising capital would, um, is, would substantially increase. Well, so have you uh, gone for subsequent rounds? Yeah, so we raised um, kind of a seed angel round. So the first, our first investor was um, met by, we met a guy called Kevin, Kevin Hartz through the um, Entrepreneurship Club of the GSB a networking dinner or something, so that was our first investor. Uh, the guy that led our um, Series A, uh, GSB um, guy called Greg Waldorf, who runs eHarmony, he's on our board, um, introed from Barcelona and someone else. And then um, Series B, Axel, she's, it's frighteningly GSB. It feels too clubby. It feels like some, there's some mafia thing going on. Our board is mostly GSB. Um, but, you know, that's the power of the network. Um, so, you know, those and those connections were primarily driven out of GSP connections. Pete, Pete's point on having a prototype, I, I think, is huge. Uh, I mean, it's, I think it carries from websites to medical devices to anything. Uh, another entrepreneur once told me that um, investors are very smart but often lack imagination. And uh, having a prototype kind of just 
allows them to really see and feel or, or understand exactly how it's supposed to work. Um, and so I, I know it's invaluable for, for raising capital. Uh, and I, it's also kind of funny. I feel like uh, you know you're ready to have capital when you suddenly feel like you don't really need it because you've somehow struggled and, and gotten to, to improve something that you never thought would be possible without having money first. And then you get there and you're like, oh, you know, I didn't even need the capital. I don't want to even take people's money. Uh, but, and that's when people typically are like, well, we're ready to give you money. Alyssa? Uh, I, th I was thinking about what these guys were saying in terms of the prototype versus not. I think in terms of the, the, the life cycle of being an entrepreneur, I think the first time you're out of the gate, you're freshly minted MBA, you know, from the GSB no less, you're selling sizzle and a sexy PowerPoint deck and maybe a fancy model too, um, and of course yourself. I think that actually, and other people have done this very well, just raising more initially on the promise of tomorrow, more than you'll need, is prototype in hand or not, is I think the world's best advice for entrepreneurship. And I think that once you launch, you know, a beta site, a real site, a product in clinical trial, something consumers are using or, or not, all of a sudden the clock starts ticking on milestones that are, unless it's the medical device space, of the dollars and users and consumer traction kind. So it's something to be mindful of if you're raising, I think, Raising initially makes a whole, more upfront is something I would do differently the next time. Um, but uh, my story is fairly similar to these guys. I ended up um, doing a friends and family round of about a million dollars. Bottle Notes is totally capitalized by high net worth individuals to date. We've raised three and a half million, which, as Darren mentioned, is quite a lot for high nets. Um, it's been quite a labor of love. Uh, it's a lot for angel investors at fifty to one hundred thousand dollars a check. Um, our average unit is higher than most. It's around two hundred thousand, so it, it hasn't been quite as onerous in that regard, but the first the first person who gave me the green light, which was in May of before graduation, was a classmate's father that I had worked for the prior summer for his boutique import company uh, of wine. So um, that and, you know, the conversation was, would you like to come run this import company? And the answer was no, uh, but I think for the same amount you'd pay, no, because I think for the same amount you'd pay me for the next two years, uh, if you invested that seed capital in this venture, I, here's how the ROI would be different for um, for the three brands or five brands I'd be managing anyway. And that's how that whole thing kicked off. And then it was a series of relationships, personal from Chicago, my business partners in New York, and other GSB one step removed type of things. That's how we've raised the capital then and since. Um, and in terms of fundraising, uh, it has we've done two rounds. We are about four weeks away from closing our second. And again, I think that, you know, the, who we've attracted of inv as investors has uh, absolutely, as Darren mentioned, been tied to milestones, but also strategy. So when we were an Ishii Commerce play, we were picking a high net worth individuals who, for whom wine was a serious passion project. Huge sellers. They loved wine. They loved wine travel. As you morph, and as our strategy has morphed, now the investors coming to the table are people who buy into and get this notion of a premier online wine community. They've invested in other media assets. They've been early folks at Google, whatever the case may be. So at risk of, you know, stating the obvious, it, you know, the, aligning the strategy with, from a high net worth individual standpoint or even a venture fund standpoint, I mean, strategically, if, if someone's making the intro on your behalf, they're obviously going to make the connection of why it's relevant, but just even when you're doing your initial research of who you'd reach out to, would it be Greg Waldorf or someone else, for example, in Pete's case? You know, obviously people with, who, have, who have experience in, in akin industries or complementary products is something that seem to work for me. So Brad, you have a little different company. You're people intensive. You've uh, had to grow very rapidly. Uh, tell us about your financing strategy. So we, um, we bootstrapped our business. We've never raised uh, traditional outside institutional money. We did sort of a clever thing. Andrew and I kind of bootstrapped it for about $100,000 ourselves. And we didn't have to wait uh, six years for revenue. So we started raising money. In aggregate, we raised less than a million dollars from angels, which was surprisingly easy to come up with. Um, echo one point uh, Alyssa made is if someone doesn't contribute value to your organization as an investor, if they don't add some facet of your business that, um, that you don't have, you really don't want them as investors. The other thing is early on, the guys who put $10,000 into our business were way more of a nuisance than the people that put $200,000 into our business and got it. So that's one little aside. 
just tactically how we did it, though. Then we started raising essentially a bridge round that stayed open, 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 open until we closed our bridge round, which converted to the um, valuation. What that let us do is have a lot of milestones for a very long runway. When we closed our closed our round, um, you know, minimized dilution for us. So we and, and it fits into sort of our whole strategy is we didn't want to be driven to an exit. We wanted to be driven to create long-term great business that you know someday will be hopefully in the Capital One or very large business of kind of underserved consumers. And we really did think one for dilution, two for control, and three to be driven to a short-term exit. It didn't sort of match up with with what our vision was for the business. Um, so we, we also did one other uh, kind of interesting thing, which is the, the model when we first started was, this is way more detailed than you guys are going to want, but we would charge someone 25% of what we saved them. That was this ROI-based pricing. We realized we're broke and we need to hire people. And so the early hires, we paid them nothing, literally nothing. And we gave them some equity and we said, we hope we'll be able to pay you in the future. And people trusted us and came on board. John Helm, who to this day is our EVP of operations. All of our early hires are still to this day with us. We've been very fair to them over the long term. The other thing we did is we went to, we realized, can we switch our economic model to force our customers to finance our growth? And we figured out a way to charge them earlier in the process. And by signing up more customers, bizarrely, it started becoming a positive working capital business that then we didn't have to raise much more money. Again, minimize dilution. We didn't have to concede control. And um, it let us pick board of directors who we really love and trust and, and appreciate our vision and not a guy who has, you know, voting control and tells us what we can and can't do. Great. So I want to turn it open to questions from the audience now. Um, and you can ask general questions or ask of a specific individual. Hey, really quick, can I just say yeah. something on this financing thing? I, I'll, I'll, uh, Pete will, will uh, resent me now, but... We've been into Sequoia many times. We get cold called a fair amount. But they did a brilliant study that I love, and hopefully Alyssa is going to love this, is they did a regression and correlated their biggest returns over history with the amount of capital raised. And it, it, when I was in business school, this thing, or, or right before, of raising $200 million for a dot-com was like the big thing, right? They realized that the businesses that essentially bootstrapped or were very lean on capital and were very efficient with capital were huge to the skew of, of several standard deviations over to the success and the return. We think for us, one thing that that's taught us is capital efficiency. Also, it forces operational discipline. And you can't band-aid over operational problems or strategic problems or marketplace problems with money by hiring or throwing dollars at, at it. You've got to fix fundamentally an issue when you're cheap and scrappy and small. For us, I think that's a, you know, it, it's easier to raise money and hire. But, um, if you're willing to work hard and roll up your sleeves, I think long term, it's it's kind of a for us, it's been a cool thing. I yeah. wanted to add to that that there's a venture fund of Altos Ventures in town. There, it's all GSB guys, and they um, invested in one of our classmates. And I, I did a reference for them, and I was really just poking around their site and their strategy. And they will only invest in companies now that are raising less than five million total to get to break even. Not just because the climate, they were ahead of the curve there for that be cut based on that exact same study. So I think that's heartening. Not that there aren't zillions of stories, Netflix and others, of raising 110 and turning, or Zappos and you name it, uh, that it, we're raising a lot works. And I have complete confidence in truly it will make it happen even, you know, with 33 million in the bank. But I absolutely can say that the only other caution of, um, of, of being, not necessarily in Brad's case, where you're hitting that break-even point early enough and it's a positive cash flow situation where you can grow the business organically. And m my case, which it's this hybrid consumer technology thing, so you've still got some major technology expenses, which requires a bunch of labor and people, which is capital in intensive, but also revenues. So wh where, where do you, you know, first of all, raising enough to get to that point, even if it's not a lot, is still critical. But also, um, I think one of the big fears in raising, having a totally angel-backed business as a uh, Brad has also already alluded to is not necessarily getting the panache or even the expertise of phenomenal board members, and I have found that to be absolutely not the case. One of the best pieces of advice I got from a VC friend when I was starting this, knowing I wasn't going the VC route, was if you want to build, you know, a, a Fortune 500 company, so to speak, start with a Fortune 500 board. So you know, ask the guy who founded Netflix to be on the board, and ask one of the founders, not Reed, but. Um, one of the founding team members, and ask Jack Cakeford, who's one of the founders of, and fathers of Napa Valley, and since then we've taken on the CEO of Encyclopedia Britannica, um, former CEO of that as well. And so, you know, I think that 
akin to what we were saying in the beginning, that people are willing to invest in you as entrepreneurs because they want to see you succeed, particularly if they have a connection to the GSB. Um, I think the same is also true of other entrepreneurs, GSB or otherwise, that you know, another classmate of ours, Kirk Hawkins, has a phenomenal company called Icon Aircraft, and I, you know, someone said to him, who do you want, who would be your dream board member, you know, in your business plan and a bunch of ideas, and he said, this guy, and called up the guy and got him, and, and people want to, people want to see you win, and by and large, I think that even if you're not venture-backed, you can really put together a phenomenal board, which I have found extremely beneficial and useful uh, as stewards of the business. And just to clarify, raising money and being frugal are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> Good. If you want to come to our office in the mission, <laughs> Good. Um, you can get past the homeless guy on the doorstep, and you can see what I mean. Yeah. No, you know, it, it, it's a very important lesson to be frugal with money, and I think if you look at the people who have grown big companies, they, they'll, all tell you, they'll all tell you that. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you don't need any money. It just yeah. means he has to be frugal with it. Uh, there was a question out here, right here. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, I guess, a general question. How, coming straight out of business school and wanting to start a business, you gain credibility, whether it's making your first sale, vendors, partners, board members, so aside from maybe like the GSB link, um, especially if you don't have an entrepreneurial background. So let me see if I can repeat the question. So the question is, how do you gain credibility early on? Is that right? When you go out of, when you come out of business school, is it? We've, they've talked about a prototype. Uh, they've talked about um, um, get, hitting milestones. And you're suggesting maybe there's some other way that you, you gain credibility. Is that right? I mean, you go, you know, you walk into an, an angel investor. So let's assume there's no GSP yeah. link. And how are you going to sell yourself to the fact, like, I can really do this when you have no, I mean, you need So to how are you going to sell yourself to, to uh, an angel or a VC if you have no, no experience doing this? So who wants to take that? Well, one, one clarification. Um, selling to VCs and selling to angels are two very different processes. Um, VCs are all about measurable returns in their pockets. Um, angels, uh, they want a return, but a lot of that return is sometimes psychological, um, whereas in sometimes, I guess as Alyssa said, you know, they're very passionate about um, the industry that, or the, the concept that you're working on, and they want to help you uh, with that. And so they're willing to kind of kick in the money, um, even on the earlier side when it's really risky and the, the returns to their wallet aren't, aren't you know, in sight. But, but, but in ter I agree with that 100%. And it, but in terms of how to shore up credibility, I think, you know, an advisory board is an extraordinarily important tool, at least it was for me. I mean, just having an advisory board of really deep industry expertise coming out of the GSB, 26, never run a never, you know, had been in politics, never been in business, let alone start a company. Um, you know, having this bench of people who wanted to see us win and, you know, founder of Christie's Wine Department, uh, you know, Pete Mandavi Jr., who's a GSB guy, Jack Cakebread, I mean, all these people, plus other and a few, you know, all-stars in, in, from the technology world, people who, are, who want to see you win. And so it's, it's a likes attract likes thing, right? I mean, if they see these people who are obvious success stories surrounding you and advising you and coaching you, then all of a sudden the risk is somewhat, by no means all the way, but somewhat mitigated. Yeah, I would, I would agree, advisors. And, and then the two other things, one is PR. And if you obviously it's more difficult if you're pre-launch, um, and then secondly is just knowing your stuff. If you spend six months knowing your industry, speaking to customers, know your stuff, and be prepared to answer every question in detail, then then that is more credibility than anything else. Right here to that end. If there's one venture guy that you have to have on, I wouldn't go to that person first. You, you, you go to that person last once you've got it really dialed in. What are some positive and negatives with your age? I mean, I'm sure that becomes an issue, especially as you hire people <coughs> older than you and sort of deal with people on a personal level as sort of an incredible young person running a company. So the question is, once you start running a business, what are the positives and negatives about being young? Maybe I'll speak to this because maybe I'm on the, uh, on the younger end of uh, the spectrum since I graduated in 07. Uh, yeah, I'd walk into VCs and they'd be like, oh, you went to Duke, you know, maybe you know the such and such. And then they'd be like, well, what year do you graduate? Oh, three. Oh, you're a kid. 
Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, at, at the. It's really interesting that if you do, as you know, Pete was saying, if you know your stuff and you and you can really speak to the um, speak to the industry, speak to your customers, understand your competitors, where they're failed, where they're opportunities, um, and you you do you say you're going to set out to do something and then you hit that, you know, that's what builds respect and they you know, in in a, like in my particular case, uh, I was talking I was trying to do what uh, Alyssa was saying and get some great advisors on board, and these advisors were saying you're crazy, like I spent three years of my life trying to do this, couldn't do it, it's impossible. Um, and had to go and do six months and figure out how to get the preclinical model working. And then once we did, the next week he said, this is amazing. I, I can't believe you did it. I'm on board. So I, I think results speak much louder than age or anything else. Well, maybe the question also had to do about running the organization, not just raising the money. Is that right? Once you're sort of operating. How that runs. Yeah, sort of operating. You've got your money, and now you're trying to deal with Partners, suppliers, and importantly, employees. So, like, we just grabbed one of the um, one of the top people from one of our competitors, and it was based on our, our results of the business. Um, and this person's, you know, almost twice my age. <laughs> so, Brad, you probably have more people yeah. in your company than others. So, what, what about that aspect of it? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't. Um I'm not the right person. I don't think about this. I really, it doesn't even, I don't know. I don't even process the thought. I think you outwork people. You earn their respect. You have success. They trust you, shared values. I think age, maybe it's something when someone meets you for 10 seconds that they, they deal with. I don't think it's there. You know, our CFO, Rich, is, he was GSP 73. Brilliant guy. He's like a good friend of mine. You know, we get dinner. These, it, it goes away very quickly. When you're in, sitting in business school, it probably feels a little less tangible and real. When you get out and you're working in a team, the age is not a, it's not a factor. But, but work ethic is. I mean, I think as sure. at the helm of any organization at any age where youth is an obvious advantage in terms of energy and stamina, of course. I mean, I, I have, I am the first person on email and I'll be the last person at the end of every single day. I, you, I don't know how you earn respect of anyone of any age working for you or with you um, without outworking them because they're buying into a, a vision and a dream, at least initially, that you're putting forth. So, if, if you aren't zealous in your pursuit of it, how how does you have to be to instill confidence? But you want to be if it, if you're really passionate about it. Um, but it, I mean, I also think that there's the other side of age, right? I mean, I don't I really don't say this to be self promoting, but I was in Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30 this year, and it got a lot of attention. I made it by like you know, under the wire by a week. It was it was great, and um, I think there's a notion of if you're a hotshot like Darren and you're right out of school and you've got this great medical device and you can get it done in six months and they couldn't get it done in three years and you're young and you're hungry, I mean, look at Zuckerberg at Facebook. I mean, it, it, youth is an advantage. Make no mistake about it. It's just a question. I mean, all the other obvious things about managing an organization, and I totally agree in terms about working people. To me, that's and, – and just general maturity and poise, I think, are how you combat it. You're probably going to get some selection bias too. If it's an issue for somebody, they won't work for you. That's fine. You don't want to. Right here. It's an open question for the entire panel. To the extent you guys have any outstanding loans after graduation, how did you manage a portion of that budget? I'm not sure I, I got that. I'll say, say Student it again. loans? You, your personal leverage? Yes. So you needed an income? So it wouldn't have worked for us. We were, we were both very fortunate that we didn't have student loans when we came out. Um, partly of the jobs we had going into school. And we'd, we'd both, in our year, you had worked for five years before you came to, to business school. I think that's changed a little bit now. Um, you raise money, probably. You know, It lets you pay your salary. You know, that's, that's, that's the expectation. Probably not a, you know, not a lot, but um, lets you pay a salary. But our business, we didn't pay ourselves for three years. Two years, we paid ourselves zero. Third year, we paid ourselves $36,000 a year. If we had student debt, we couldn't have done it. Right here. So how do you raise money, more money than you need, and still maintain credibility? Yeah. So 
Well, Alyssa, I think you're the one who said that. Oh, I'm, 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 there are many things I have going for me. The, the, the being overcapitalized is not one of them. Um, when, you are, when you are high net worth individual backed and it's the nuclear winter of the capital equity markets and it's a tough time um, of the money we've raised, uh, the way you do it is you create a market like in anything in life. So what happens is when you're fundraising is that you are talking to a large universe of people. And I think this is true for angels and VCs, but the, but Peter Darren can speak more with more expertise there. Um, you're talking to a large universe of people and you're raising a million or in this case three. And when you're raising $3 million, you're talking, you know, in terms of conversion rates, you're talking to, if you're raising a million dollars, you're talking to a hundred people and you hope that 10 will come in for a hundred thousand dollars each. So as you get close, as you've got six and seven hundred thousand dollars committed, what you do is to all those maybes, and hopefully, you know, there are more than three maybes left. Hopefully, there are thirteen maybes left. You go to all of them, and you say you're raising a million, and you get twenty people who are maybe interested, and you hopefully can for a hundred thousand dollars each, and you hopefully close twelve or thirteen of them. So basically, what it means is that you just oversubscribe the round, and success breeds success, and you know. And, that, and that's simply the answer. I mean, you just, it's authentic because what you need to get there is still the $800,000 or $850,000 you said you'd need to get there with a $150,000 buffer. But if these last people in the last two weeks before the deal closes just have to be in the deal and it's just going to give you a little more buffer. And yes, as an entrepreneur, you're going to take a little hit in terms of equity. But for that buffer, it's a no-brainer to me. Hey, you, uh, you have some money in the bank. How did you get um, the extra in? I didn't think, like... Raising money, more money than you think you need, I don't think that is negatively relate, correlated with lack of credibility. credibility. So I think um, I think you just need to be conservative and frugal. And, and um, you know, we, were, we always raised our money with the expectation of never being able to raise any more money ever again. And, you know, as you raise the money, we plan a business to say, well, this is the last, last money we will need. Um, and so we staggered our business plan as we made so, hit certain milestones. We saw a bigger opportunity. We raised more money accordingly. So, um, so raising money, I think, um, and everyone says just raise more money than you need. And when someone's giving you money, take it. <coughs> I follow that advice. There are a few tricks, though, that you, you can use. I know a lot of entrepreneurs do use for kind of explaining why additional funds are necessary. So one, um, and kind of learned this in Medtronic, is you buffer, you know, the costs of certain of some big ticket <laughs> items because you know things happen, um, and sometimes vendors will will like all of a sudden do price increase effective January first, and it's ten percent or twenty five percent more, and if that's a, a thirty percent you know line <laughs> item for you in your budget. I mean, you're going to be really glad that you buffered that, and if you didn't, well, that just extends your runway. A bit, and and that kind of leads to the second thing you can do, and and often investors want to hear is that you're leaving additional funds for run runway because it always takes uh, more time than you think it's going to take to raise the next round of capital, uh, and so they always want to see you know at least three months of runway, sometimes you know six months, and your your burn rate does not never goes down, um, so you know you're just forecasting your burn rate out, and you realize you're going to need you know three to six months of additional cash. So it's not the money that you just need to hit your milestone. It's, it's money to last you to the next round. So I think we'll have to make this the last question. Right back there. Um, there's great uncertainty of pursuing a new venture, um, and you may have had a number of ideas when you were developing the one that you're now pursuing today. I was wondering if there was, or if you could describe the eureka moment when you decided, I'm going to pursue this full throttle, this is it. So great uncertainty when you're trying to start a new business and is there, was there a eureka moment when you decided that you could really do this? Um, I think I went through my, my uh, experience a little bit. The eureka moment was a bunch of market analysis combined with seeing tangibly a friend doing this. L let me just even put that aside for a second. I think, so I had a slightly different experience. I took a job after school doing private equity, getting paid very well. I was so unfulfilled. And being in the GSB, it, it's sort of a selfish thing, but you get the sense of entitlement of you can do anything and you get access to these great cases and great people. Don't ever lose that. And you guys are maybe peaking at that moment in your professional careers right now, frankly. That's a really unique time to go out and get it and do things and, and be very uh, uh, adventurous and entrepreneurial. 
the risk of never doing it is very high. The risk of going out and doing it and failing, guess what? You're still a really smart person with you know, probably a great undergrad degree, great network, a GSB degree. Anyone's going to hire you in the future, maybe any year other than this year, guys. But you know, <laughs> the risk is not that high, I would posit. The risk of not doing it, taking a job, getting carry for a venture firm, five years later it gets harder to leave, ten years later harder to leave. I have so many classmates that look at me now and say, God damn it, why didn't you push me off the ledge and tell me to start a company in 2002? I, I have kids, I've got a mortgage, I make just enough money where I can't ever justify leaving again. I think that risk is very high. Anybody else have an answer to that? I think you know the Eureka moment, you know it when it happens. But at the same time, every business starts somewhere and ends up somewhere else. So just don't be um, uh, be bloody-minded enough to follow your vision, but don't be so blinkered not to be open to new opportunities because your business will 99% uh, certainty be somewhere else than you thought it would be originally. Recognize there may be more than one eureka moment, huh? Yeah. And I think that the notion, I have a brother who's an actor in Broadway and film, and he... People ask him all the time, how do you know you should be an actor with all the starving artist stuff? And he said, when you, you know you can't do, you can't not do it. And I think that that's both true for the idea, but also just as an entrepreneur. I mean, there are millions of ideas as entrepreneurs that swim through your mind, as I'm sure you guys all already know, on a daily basis. And so that one idea is a combination of passion and market timing and all that other stuff. But how do you know if you're an entrepreneur? Either you probably take a job and you feel unfulfilled or you just know you can't, you're fundamentally unemployable as the joke goes, or you, you just cannot not do it. You can't not be going Mach 10 with your hair on fire with the pit in your stomach, the fear and the excitement and the enthusiasm and the, the energy and the dream. I mean, you can't not do it. That's, I think, the... And if you can not do it, then seriously think about it because it's fun and it's hard. But in this economy, why wouldn't you do it? <laughs> I, I, I think there's also a fundamental difference between the need that you want to solve and then the solution. So as, as Brad was saying, like he, he found this really interesting industry, you know, con with the uh, consumer credit, uh, and you know there was obviously a fundamental need there that he he saw first, and then he had to figure out well what's the concept, like what's the best way of running the business model to to solve that. Um, and went through customer interviews. Um, and I, I think it's you know, really important to understand that there's a need that needs to be solved and that it's worth solving. Uh, and then, then the second part comes where the, with the ideation. And you can actually do a process of brainstorming and trying to get to that solution. And uh, I spent six months with my team looking for that solution, brainstorming on whiteboards, like culling ideas, um, asking uh, advisors on which ideas they thought would work, and, the, and none of them were good. Uh, it was completely worthless, uh, I, I thought, first. Uh, and then uh, someone was, went to the meat market one day and picked up you know, something and you know, started playing with it. And we were just talking in a group. And you know what? It just happened to form the right shape in his hands. And Eureka is, Eureka is like a company. Uh, um, Sometimes that can really just happen, but I, I really think it was because we'd, uh, we'd gone through literally hundreds of ideas, we were able to spot you know, the one you know, incidental you know, moment that, uh, that something actually came together. Well, that sounds like a good eureka moment to end on. Thank you, uh, Brad, Darren, Pete, and Alyssa. Appreciate your time. <laughs>